Hello, and welcome back to another Masterworks Week at the Florida Orchestra. I'm Ed Parsons, General Manager, and always a pleasure to have with us our Music Director, Michael Francis. Thanks very much, Ed. Great pleasure to be back for our third week in January of this marvelous marathon of majestic music that you're about to hear. This is a fantastic week of music as well. Yes, and we start our uh, concert with music by Jesse Montgomery. You may remember uh, we opened our first Masterwork concert this, scene, this season with a piece by Jessie Montgomery. Um, her music mixes classical music with elements of pop, improvisation, and social justice. Her work Starburst, that we'll hear this week, is a brief one-movement work for a string orchestra. It was written for the Sphinx Virtuosi while Jessie was their composer in residence. The Sphinx organization promotes the advancement of people of color in the classical music industry, and their premier group, the Virtuosi, is made up of dynamic young professionals. What, it, it was this dynamism that inspired Jesse to write the work. In the music, we hear rapidly changing musical colors and exploding gestures that are juxtaposed with gentle, fleeting melodies in an attempt to, as the composer describes, create a multi-dimensional soundscape. Yes, and I think Jessie is a, a fantastic composer, and what you can tell straight away is that she is a string player, and not just writing for strings as maybe a wind or a percussion or a, or a pianist, but a real feeling for how the instruments work. So the music is challenging, but it's exi exciting, it's vibrant, and as the title suggests, it bursts off the page like a glorious galaxy of stars in front of us, and is a perfect way to start our program, which has a very much an otherworldly um, quality. If there is to be a narrative that spreads through this, it is something outside of normal reality. And our next piece is by Ravel. It's his Mother Goose Music for the Ballet. This work began life as a suite of children's piano pieces, composed between 1908 and 1910, setting music to children's stories, notably from Charles Perrault's Mother Goose Tales, published in 1697. It was Ravel's publisher, Jacques Durand, that saw the potential of these pieces to be bigger than what they were. He persuaded Ravel to orchestrate them, which became the commonly heard Mother Goose Suite. The dance impresario, Jacques Rocher, who a few years later would head the Paris Opera, suggested fleshing out the suite into a ballet divertissement, which is the version we will hear this week. And as a special treat, our visual artist in residence, Jeff Strick, once again has created some paintings to accompany the music, helping to evoke the images that Ravel so masterfully expresses in the music. And for Ravel, childhood stories are very important. It is often described when people who knew him felt that he was rather immature as a man and was often looking to spend time with children in a company of children, talking about children's stories. And for him, it's that magical idea of the fairy tale um, that, of course, allows you just to wipe the slate clean at any point. No matter the trouble that you're in, flick of the magic wand and all is well with the world. And around this time, as we're heading up towards the First World War, it just was a troubled time. Uh, and a difficult time for Ravel during the First World War, his mother passed, which was a truly devastating um, point for him in, in his life. He was very close. Again, that childlike quality, that necessity of a maternal influence was very strong for him. And in this piece, um, it is effectively five separate movements, but what Ravel did is he fleshed it out, added a couple of others, and created a narrative. So whereas in the original, we would have had the beginning Sleeping Beauty, then we had Tom Thumb, then we had the um, Empress of the Pagodas, Beauty and the Beast, and the Fairy Garden, he's reordered it so he can have a story. And then the opening movement um, is the prelude. And in the prelude, um, we hear the the horns giving us the idea of the king and queen. It's the royal christening in which beauty has been born and all the fairies turn up. And in this instance, um, of course, the evil fairy turns up and says that she will prick her finger on a spindle by her 16th birthday and then she will die. And the good fairy says, well, she won't die. She'll just fall asleep for a hundred years. And so at the end of the prelude, as we head into the golden spinning wheel, uh, we start to uh, really notice that Ravel has got a fantastic capacity of showing dynamism and narrative and the imagery that he conjures up just by this whirling idea 
this idea of the girl's curiosity on her, before her 16th birthday, and of course the danger of this old woman on the spindle about to prick her finger. Have a listen to this. And towards the end of that movement, then the music builds up to a rather shocking climax as that moment happens. And then she slowly drifts down to sleep. And in this ballet, some of the most magical music happens in between the main movements. It's the way that he threads the narrative together. And when we hear the beginning of the original Sleeping Beauty movement, and Ravel has a brilliant way of capturing that sense of timelessness. And he does it ironically by giving us a clock passing in a very slow tempo and this flute melody that keeps going up and going down and always coming back to where it was. And so the whole castle has now been put to sleep so that when um, the Sleeping Beauty does eventually awaken or hopefully awaken, then everybody who she recognizes will be around, except, of course, her father and mother, the king and queen, who were away. Then we come to Beauty and the Beast, and this is a brilliant example of Ravel's sense of orchestration. How to show that in music? Well, the clarinet represents beauty at the very beginning in this elegant waltz, this gentle, childlike, beautiful idea. And at this point, we're in Sleeping Beauty's dreams. This is now the dream world in which all these other stories come to life. That's how we threaded the narrative through. And just listen to this wonderful, elegant, and fleet-footed um, sense of a girl's purity and innocence. But for the contrabassoon, this is what we represent as the beast. And here, Ravel uses a great analogy, which is always of the low voice, the deep voice, the male voice, the adult voice against the childlike high quality. And the simple change in tessitura gives us that rather quirky, unusual, and cumbersome character of the beast. And, and you can hear in the way that the strings come in underneath it. There's nothing elegant about it. It's awkward as the beast tries to entice beauty with proposes a marriage which of course she turns away and at the end of it um, then he gets transformed into Prince Charming when she sees that she should marry him for his heart and that's when Prince Charming appears. But have a listen to the Contra Pursuit. So at this point now, Prince Charming has appeared, and Prince Charming then becomes the main character of the next one, which is Tom Thumb, or Thumbling, as it is known, the story of the boy who goes into the forest and leaves the breadcrumbs to find his way out, and the birds come and pick it. Here, the music feels very lonely and reminding us that the woods, even though a place of magic, is always a place of danger for us, as Prince Charming gradually gets closer to Sleeping Beauty. And the music starts in a brilliant, starts with two beats in a bar, then three beats, then four, then five always rising, always coming back as we try one path, get lost and try the next one along.
So as I mentioned, in between these movements, you have this beautiful threading of the needle for the narrative. And here's a great example. As we prepare ourselves for the Empress of the Pagodas, the little ugly girl who, in, in her bath time, imagines that she's now with uh, this beautiful Empress and that there's the green serpent that comes along. But the way that he sets it up with this moonlight idea in the harp and Celeste reminds us that Ravel was the master of orchestration. He could conjure up sounds in the orchestra that no one had ever heard before. Of course, we think of Ravel's Bolero, that simple melody that just grows and grows and grows until the great climax, all done with just orchestration. And what you'll notice in that also is that there's a pentatonic sound. It sounds like it's from the Far East. And the World Fair that was in Paris beforehand, um, they would have all heard and seen exotic sounds for the first time. Debussy was hugely influenced by it, so was Ravel. And this idea of new harmonic scales, new harmonies that were going on uh, from the Far East and other places uh, was enormously influential. The Gamelan from Java. Uh, and it was um, it was very, very important change in Western music, I would say, that world fair. And finally, we come to the fairy garden, this moment where Beauty and Prince Charming have now met. He's woken her up with a kiss, of course, and the ending is some of the most glorious music you'll ever wish to hear, this apotheosis, which starts with just pure beauty in life, and then everyone wakes up, and at the end of it, we have this great soaring wedding, and all is well with the world, and they live happily ever after. Here's the beginning of the fairy garden. Simply wonderful music, and Jeff Strick has done a fantastic job of creating the paintings for us to understand the narrative, but also look at the metaphor for it and how it connects to our life. And the way that it will thread through this will be such an engaging, visual, sumptuous, and oral feast for the eyes and ears. This is certainly a concert you will not want to miss. And to round out our program this week, we have Rachmaninoff's Variations on a Theme of Paganini. And to perform it with us, is the wonderful pianist Natasha Paremsky. Natasha was born in Moscow, um, but em emigrated to the United States at age eight with her family and is now a US citizen living in New York. She is known for her dazzling technique and deep musical sensibility, both of which we will hear plenty of in Rachmaninoff's variations on theme of Paganini. The legend of Niccolo P Paganini has haunted many composers. He was perhaps the greatest violinist that ever lived and was a real rock star in his day. Not only did he have virtuoso pyrotechnics um, in his technique, his performances of subtle melodies would often bring people to tears. He was also a composer, most notably his works for a solo violin, which are fiendishly difficult. Some of the most famous are his 24 caprices, and it is the last of these caprices that serves as the foundation for Rachmaninoff's work. And let's have a listen to that um, theme, it's something you'll all recognize straight away, and for this we have our concert master, Jeffrey Mulder, to play for us. So this is the theme from the last Paganini caprice, very famous, number 24, and also the theme that Rachmaninoff uses for this magnificent piece that we're going to play for you this weekend. So at this point,
point when Rachmaninoff wrote this piece in the mid-1930s, he'd left Russia, he left in 1917, around the time of the revolution, and headed to the United States. He was a prolific composer until that point, but of course a great pianist. But when he arrived in America, he realized he needed to make money. So, because he was probably the greatest pianist who ever lived, he embarked upon a full virtuoso career. And in some years, he did up to 80 concerts, um, traveling all around the world and was more famous for that. Indeed, he wrote very few pieces after arriving until the rest of his career. There was the fourth piano concerto, a um, series of s solo pieces, the Rhapsody on the theme of Paganini, um, the third symphony and the symphonic dances, but not, not many in comparison. And I think what attracted Rachmaninoff to this was that myth of Paganini. He was this almost diabolical figure, this idea that someone who made the pact with the devil for his gifts, Mephistophelian um, connection to the dark stories, Orpheus, or, or something sort of Faust Don Juan, this idea of someone who sold himself to get the great gifts of, of, of hypnotic power over people. It was said that Paganini had an amazing capacity to hypnotize people with his playing. And of course, he was very famous with the ladies as well. He was dark, he looked dreadful, sort of a rasputin type figure. And one of his tricks was when he played, he deliberately saw his top two strings, which would then magically break during the concert, and he'd do the rest of it just on his lower two strings. A real showman, and probably the first of the true virtuosos, um, and Rachmaninoff being another one in the, in the 20th century. So at this point, when he wrote this, he took this theme and created this rather fantastic narrative. It's, it's a one-movement piece of music, but it's divided into three sections, very much like a normal piano concerto. And there's always this sense of melancholy and darkness with Rachmaninoff that he never seems to shake off until actually his very last piece, The Symphonic Dances. And at the beginning, we can feel this theme that comes out on the piano. It's rather skeletal, rather thin, and a little bit dangerous. Something threatening or dark is going on. Something for Rachmaninoff is so important is the theme of the Dies Irae. This theme, the dean dan 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 dean dan dan, that comes in all of his music. You hear it in Berlioz's Simply Fantastique, you hear it in Liszt, you hear it in, in Respighi. But for Rachmaninoff, he puts it in so many of his pieces. Why? He heard it when he was a child in Russian Orthodox Church, and it haunted him. It was like a spectre, a ghost, that he never managed to shake off until he finally exorcised it in the symphonic dances at the end of his career and the end of his life. And here when it kicks in, it really does feel like the devil has appeared. This is otherworldly. If we've had fairy tales of Ravel, now we have the supernatural, but absolutely something dark and menacing. Indeed, he actually wrote a letter to Fokin, the great choreographer, explaining the narrative of this piece in which you have this Paganini figure who has made this Faustian pact with darkness. And so the, the first 10 variations effectively make up section one, the fast opening allegro of this concerto. Then if section two begins at variation 11, and now suddenly this more amorous, this more loving idea comes through. Our dark figure has a power now to make romance. And Rachmaninoff really was a romantic composer amongst 20th century modernist giants like Schoenberg and Stravinsky. He was something from an other age. And here we start to hear this rhapsodic idea, this loving theme come to pass.
And at the end of section two, we have the most famous of all the variations. That wonderful one in which he inverts the da 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 dim, goes to di da 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 da. Now inverted, now the loving theme. He jokingly wrote to his agent, this one's for you, because he knew this would be the killer moment which would just melt everybody's heart. And uh, been used in so many films, I always think of that marvelous moment in Groundhog Day, one of my favorite films with Bill Murray when he plays that at the end of it. But really a, a, a great example of Rachmaninoff's open-hearted, emotional, beautiful music that we all know and love. So straight after this, we then go into the third section of the piece, uh, which is a brilliant, diabolical game of outrageous virtuosity and orchestral colors and and we just fly forward till the very end and listen to the very last moment. You think you're building up to a huge climax like the end of the third symphony, but at the end, ha ha ha, there's a little diabolical wink. Humor, darkness, melancholy, brilliance, virtuosity, and romance. All the things that we love, caps, encapsulated uh, in such a brilliant, tightly, well, it's about 23, 24 minutes. It's not long to this piece of music, but he says so much in these 24 variations. Thank you very much. Hope you can join us this weekend, either live or on demand um, from our website. Hope to see you there. Thank you.